Number 10, Abe the Wrestler. At 20 years old with a record of 300 fights and one loss, he stands 6'4 inches at 185 pounds. Your future president of the United States, honest Abe, the chair, give him the chair. That's right, Abe Lincoln was quite the ruffian. However, the wrestling back then wasn't as organized as there was no WWF per se. It was mostly just a show of strength and skill, but they were competitions among men. Huge crowds gathered, towns watched, everybody gambled, it was great. A little wrestling. His fights earned him respect while campaigning too. He would even scrap hecklers at debates. Yeah, just walks down midpoint and wheeler whips someone under their neck. His chirps were amazing too. He would just look at people like Gladiator and call them out. He'd be like, hey, I'm the big buck of this lick. If any of you want to try it, come on and get your wet horns. Yeah, I didn't think so. Sorry, Mr. Douglas, proceed. Thank you. Number nine, Roy Sullivan. They say lightning never strikes the same place twice, but if you knew Roy Sullivan, you knew that's not entirely true. Yeah, meet the man who was struck by lightning seven times and lived to tell the tale. Roy Sullivan was born in 1912. He sadly passed away in 1983 when he was 71 years old, but God tried, God tried a few times to get him out earlier, it seems. He was born in Greene County, Virginia. Roy was a park ranger in Shenandoah National Park in 1936. He was nicknamed the Human Lightning Conductor, and he appeared in the Guinness Book of World Records. Roy's first encounter with, you know, the might of Thor, was when he was just 30 years old at the Fire Lookout Tower. He said that lightning strike, again, out of the seven he survived, was the most painful out of all of them. The lightning bolt burned a strip all the way down his leg, even blowing a hole through his shoe. Yet somehow he survived. Roy was also hit by lightning in 1969 while driving a truck, and also in 1970 while gardening on an otherwise clear day like today, also in 1972 while inside a guardhouse, also in 1976 during another storm, and finally in 1977 while fishing. Yeah, Roy passed away in 1983, and to this day, two of his ranger hats are on display at the Guinness World exhibits in New York City and South Carolina. This man cheated death eight times. Seven. Number eight, Miss Unsinkable. Violet Constant Jessup, AKA the queen of sinking ships, or Miss Unsinkable, was an Argentine Irish woman who worked as an ocean liner stewardess, memoirist, and Red Cross nurse in the early 20th century. Jessup is well known for having survived three sinkings of major ships the RMS Olympic in 1911, the RMS Titanic in 1912, and her sister, the HMHS Britannic in 1916. Yeah, talk about the luckiest person ever. Lady's got some angels watching over her, I swear. The first ship, they turned around and made it back just in time. The Titanic, well, watch the movie, you'll understand. And then the third ship, it must have just felt personal by that point. Really? Not to mention barely surviving tuberculosis as a child. This woman is truly a saint. Returning to work after all those accidents, dedicating her entire life to the Red Cross, trying to save others? Sadly, she passed away at 83. Number seven, lost at sea. The Robertson family, they're quite a historical one. Strap in, folks. Back in 1971, Dougal, Lynn, and their four children, and Douglas, Neil, and Sandy, all set sail on what was planned to be a trip around the world. It sounds magnificent. Our family saw a movie once. Aboard their 13 meter boat, the Lucette, they traveled through the Caribbean and then across the Panama Canal to the Pacific, right? That was their trail. A year and a half went by, they were on route through the Galapagos and one of the daughters, Anne, who was 18, decided to leave the voyage. Yeah, she's like, ah, you know what? I'm actually not on board for this anymore. I'm really seasick, bye. And then in Panama, they took on a hitchhiker named Robin Williams great name. This hitchhiker was in for more of an adventure than they thought, because after this point, their lives were never the same again. West of the Galapagos Islands, a pod of killer whales struck the boat. Wood then began to crack, and the boat subsequently started to sink. They all moved to the inflatable life raft, but after 16 days of using their own breath to keep inflating it over and over 24-7, the six of them were sadly forced to relocate into an even smaller dinghy. Then they somehow survived for 38 days at sea, while sailing towards the center of the Pacific with no goal in mind other than to survive. All they had to drink was some water left over from the Lucette, with sea turtles being their only diet. Yeah, save the turtles, unless of course you're stranded at sea. Then in that case, sorry to 52 of you. Finally, after 38 days, they were spotted by a passing Japanese fishing boat, and then thankfully they were rescued. Number six, Mad Jack Churchill. No, not that Churchill, but equally as British and even bolder. Mad Jack Churchill, AKA 
John Malcolm Thorpe Fleming Churchill was a British Army officer who fought in the Second World War with a longbow, bagpipes, and a Scottish broadsword. Dude, this guy lived a life. Was in like every war. Trained people how to fight and how to parachute. This guy was fighting machine guns with a bow and a sword. And was at like the front of the lines, leading them. Taunting people, playing the bagpipes. You know how intimidating that is? How is there not like 15 movies about this guy? Not only did he thrive in the rough stuff, guy revolutionized surfing. He was also pissed the Americans dropped some nukes. He wanted to keep fighting, you know? Like imagine that pep talk. All right lads, I'm gonna play a wee jingle here first and then I'm gonna go out, take this sword and I'm gonna start swinging. All right, good luck. Number five. Fake France. Towards the end of World War I, Paris was tired of, you know, seeing their city of love get blown to smithereens, as one would. So they figured, you know what? Let's try and fool those Germans, right? Let's try and do some trickery. Let's just build a fake Paris and then shut out all the lights. And it worked. Yeah, they psyched them out. They created a decoy, a very large decoy. The life-size stunt double was posted up only a few miles west of the actual city in order to protect it. This tiny town called Mason's Lafayette, now of course it's looking a lot more full than it was when it was, you know, a hollow shell of a fake town, now it's a tourist area. There were once three different zones set up around the real Paris. Zone A was northeast of the city, had fake train stations, mimicked a suburban region of St. Denis, but it had a big fake Garde du Nord train station, right? That was the main pull. Like, hey, come on, we're looking nice and Hopeful, come attack us, and it worked. Zone B, northwest of the city, that was Mason's Lafayette, the main fake Paris, right? And zone C was the industrial area, just east of the city. They had massive factories built with, you know, obviously nothing inside of them. This sounds pretty home alone when you think of it, but these missions only happening overnight, creating a light show with some big fancy props isn't a bad idea. It's gonna save a lot of lives and money. Lights were carefully spaced out so it looked like a breathing city from above, and they fell for it for some of the time. They looney tuned the Germans, and it worked. They're like, yeah, it's Paris. Hit that really fast, it's good. Number four, space junk. In 1961, John Glenn would become the first astronaut to successfully orbit in space. He lapped the Earth a couple times with the help of Friendship 7, NASA's command mission pushing ever closer and closer to the moon. While in space, Glenn and fellow crew noticed tiny gold particles that shone like fireflies. Quote, uh, this is Friendship 7, uh, I'll try to describe what I'm seeing up here. Uh, it's a big mass of some very small particles that are brilliantly lit up like uh, they're luminescent. I never saw anything like it, they're around a little, they're coming out of the capsule and they just look like stars, a whole shower of them coming over, over. They had come to the conclusion, it was liquid from inside the capsule and the suits leaking out. And that liquid was urine. Not aliens, not fireflies, not disintegrating ship, frozen pee pee. Ew. Yeah, guess drinking all that tang all day. Glenn flew on Discovery in 1998 and became at age 77 the oldest person to fly in space at the time. Damn Shatner. Number three, Project MDXX. If you've seen Project X, this one's gonna ring a bell or two. About 500 years ago, yep, you missed it, in 1520, for two and a half weeks in June, both England's King Henry VIII and Francis Francis I, two of the greatest monarchs in Renaissance Europe, they both threw a joint birthday party that lasted 18 days, and it only cost about $19 million by today's standards. Nice. I went mini putting for my eighth birthday. That's why I call it Project MDXX. The numerals in the year, yeah, you get it, not bad. Not only was this a chance for them to celebrate their friendship, but it was also a chance for them to try and outdo one another and continue to show off. So for this huge bash, for starters, around 12,000 people showed up and gathered in the fields of the northern tip of what is now France. All tents, costumes, decorations were all gold embellished. Guests were fed 29,000 fish, 98,000 eggs, 6,400 birds, 2,200 sheep, and 216,000 gallons of wine just to wash all that clout down. Mm. On top of that, there were jousts, wrestling matches, elaborate mask parties. I have FOMO just talking about it right now. The two kings both wanted to outdo each other, but there were rules put in place beforehand. These kings could not compete with one another during the celebrations, right? So instead, they tried to outspend each other in a nice way. They're like, oh yes, look at all of my gold. No, look at all my gold. We love blowing all of our resources in two and a half weeks. Nice. Looking good, guys. Keep it up. Number two, Olympic arts. In the early 20th century, the Olympics were getting creative, literally. Hundreds of years of blood, sport, and victorious games, and people were looking for some new events. 
1912 Summer Olympics, they decided to add official awarded medals for painting, sculpture, architecture, literature, and music. All right. One rule though, they had to be of Olympic sport nature. Paintings of people boxing, sculptures of people whipping discs around, and of course, a couple doodles of some dudes playing rugby. Which won Gene Jacoby two gold medals. Of course, these were Olympic grade pieces of art. So you know they were the best of the best. Of course, you could compete in both sport and art. American athlete Walter Winnens took the podium after winning gold in sharpshooting, and also the very first gold in sculpture. Yeah, lovely. He made a little bronze horse pulling a chariot. Isn't that nice? People just taping up their wrists, mouth guards in, and you're just sharpening your pencil. Hey, how are you? About to draw. <laughs> Good luck. And finally, number one, Jurassic Timeline. All right, this one goes out to all the T-Rexes out there. If you're watching, hit that thumbs up with your little hands. Nice big reach, hit that subscribe button. When we think of the times of the dinosaurs, we tend to think of all of them roaming the planet at one time, and then a meteor hit, and then they were all toast. But that is certainly not the case. It's a little shocking, but here's our timeline. Dinosaur communities were not only spread apart by geography, but also by time and the age of the dinosaurs. For one, it lasted so long that it included three separate geological time periods. It's a long time. Fun fact, there is more time separating the Tyrannosaurus rex from the Stegosaurus than there is separating the Tyrannosaurus rex from humans. Yeah, that's how long ago dinosaurs have been kicking, or not kicking rather, you know what I mean? We can't comprehend this time. Like this is so far away, it doesn't even make sense. We think of the ancient Egyptians, and we're like, oh, that's, I don't know. Dinosaurs? Stegosaurus, you know those herbivores with the plates on their back and the spiky tails, they always do this and take out your cars, whatever, Jurassic World, I've seen it. They roamed Earth 150 million years ago during the Jurassic period and the age of the dinosaurs. Then the T-Rex first appeared about 80 million years after the Stegosaurus had been extinct. And that was about, you know, 67 million years ago from today. This means that while 80 million years separated those two, there's only 67 million years that separate us from a T-Rex. Crazy fact. Uh, hit that thumbs up. Number 10, same day, different vows. Okay, we'll start off with a nice bright mood, okay? Let's do this. CBS News reported recently, Fred and Lynette Dubendorf, husband and wife, they were taking a stroll down the beach with their dog, just living the life, right? The ideal picture. When they noticed a message in a bottle washed up on the shore. I'd be so excited, first of all, but I'd also be concerned because I have seen Castaway. Could be anything in there, I don't know. This message could go one of two ways, but either way, I'm reading it, what's going on? Could be from Survivor, you know? It could be from an island. Taylor, the tribe has spoken. They opened it and inside they found wedding vows from another couple, Melody Kloska and Matt Bears. Yeah, they had recently got married on a beach on Lake Michigan and word spread rather quickly via the waterways, I guess. Thing is, their wedding date was the same as the couple who found the message. They took it as a sign that both pairs were meant to be, and they sent a surprising letter to the lost couple's address. That'd be kind of creepy though, on one hand, wouldn't it be? Hey, I found that message in a bottle. Here you go. Nice address, by the way. I love the furniture. Are you guys still together? Number nine. Run, rabbit, run. Yeah, so apparently Australia has like every animal in the world except the cute little fuzzy ones. Yeah, every stinger, wing, and venom you can imagine. But no cutesies, no. Well, they do now. In 1859, English settler Thomas Austin had been officially noted for the introduction of rabbits into Australia. Yeah, Auric Tolagus Caniculus, to be exact. Even though rabbits had already kind of been brought over in the first fleet to the land of Oz. Not much, couple here, couple there. But these rabbits, however, yeah, they started migrating across Australia and destroyed around two million acres of land. Ha <laughs> ha pesky widow wabbits. <laughs> yeah, basically excessive overgrazing caused widespread panic, damage, and sickness through and to the vegetation. Mate, they're bloody everywhere, these little devilish kangaroos, mate. Long bloody ears out to here, mate. Fangs down to here. Terrifying little things. Love my dear small man. Yeah, little hoppy guys. During the 19th century, the country had set up rabbit proof fences to protect its pastoral lands. Is there even such thing as rabbit proof fences? Finally, in the 1950s, the Australian government had had enough, started to use biological methods to control the excessive population. Yeah, sorry, little guys. This guy's bright idea is believed to have an immense impact on the abundance of natural resources in Australia. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Now we have no carrots, man. Number eight, legendary musical neighbors. It's weird how similar some of your neighbors are, right? Growing up, we had like three Davids on our street. 
They're all cops. Isn't that weird? I don't know. I just thought of that. They all loved cutting their lawn at 7 a.m. too. What a coincidence. How weird is that? Well, back in the 60s, rock icon Jimi Hendrix and the 18th century composer George Friedrich Handel, well, they were both neighbors. A couple hundred years apart, but neighbors nonetheless. They both lived in 23 Brook Street and 25 Brook Street in London. Now, had George had been born, you know, 200 years later, we'd have gotten the greatest collab of all time. Would have been like Watch the Throne, but times three. If you're a local, of course you'll know there's a site there now, it's a famous landmark and all that jazz. But in terms of coincidences, there's music in the air, something's going on on Brook Street. Pick up a, an instrument or two, walk by, you know, try the harp out in that room specifically. Number seven, friendly football. I'm actually happy that this really happened and it's not just like a heartfelt Pepsi commercial that they drummed up in a meeting. Growing up, I thought this was fake due to the circumstances, but nope, this actually happened. During Christmas of 1914, a truce was held between Germany and the UK. Like these people were trying to like take each other out, but you know, Christmas is Christmas. They decorated their shelters with lights and colors, exchanged gifts at no man's land, and played a game of football between the soldiers. Yeah, isn't that nice? Soccer, of course, not football, football. They're just like dudes smashing into each other. Both Germany and the UK refused to declare an official ceasefire, but both sides declared a temporary ceasefire on their own. They gathered and celebrated tizzing the season by singing carols, wrapping up gifts for each other, drinking some drinks, laughing some laughs, and of course, a slide tackle or two. Yeah, yeah, captains, captains come to me. Yeah, it's gonna be a red card for Gunther. Yeah, back five, please, I said back five. Okay, go ahead, miss. Number six, Yanni and Laurel. Okay, for our halfway point here, we have to throw in a fun recent one as well. This is kind of unbelievable, I don't know. I hope people look back on these in a thousand years, they'll be so confused what happened with Yanni and Laurel. Who were these people? Why do they talk about them so much? Remember this, Yanni, Laurel, back in 2018? I only heard Yanni for like two weeks straight, and then one day I listened and I couldn't go back. It was just Laurel all of a sudden, instead of Laurel. It went from Laurel to Laurel. Just like that, my life changed. I don't know what happened there. This got everybody talking. What is this phenomenon that happens? Same with the dress fiasco. Is it blue, is it white, is it gold? I don't know. What the hell is actually happening here? Well, many believe these viral illusions are proof that we're living in a simulation. Yeah, didn't expect me to say that, did ya? These arguments, no, the dress is blue, it's white, whatever. These situations prove that we perceive reality in our own way. Everybody's living their own individual perceived reality, so sometimes it always doesn't align. Sometimes I hear Yanny, then sometimes I hear Laurel. And then I lose my mind. I can't go back now. God, I hated this so much. The dress was in 2015. The Yanni Laurel thing was 2018. So I don't know. We're due for another glitch in the matrix. Will it be an auditory mix up? Will it be visual like the dress? What's next? Either way, I'm out. And I'm not on board. Also, it's blue. Number five. Cheers. Located on the banks of the River Shannon in Athlone, Ireland, there's some taps that I hope have been cleaned over the past couple years like thousands of years to be exact. Sean's bar has been serving drinks for as nearly as long as people have been drinking them. Along with claiming to be the oldest pub in Ireland, Sean's bar could be the oldest operating pub on the planet. In fact, in 2004, Guinness World Records issued a certificate to Sean's Bar as the oldest official pub in Ireland. The owner of Sean's Bar says that they found coins that dated to 900 AD, as well as the wattle and daub walls, which is an ancient building technique that mixed mud, wood, and clay together. Legend has it a man named Luan Mac Luachdic started the pub as a local guide to help travelers across the Shannon. Yeah, eventually a small settlement built up around the crossing point and led eventually top to a fully constructed pub. I'm pretty sure people couldn't say the name and just went with something way easier, you know what I mean? Right, are you going over to Sean McCollin McKean Michano Gold Mills for a pint after the game? No. Oh, it's Sean's bar now. Oh, that's much easier. Sean's, I'll meet you, Sean's. Number four, the gym twins. Back in 1979, a set of twins were reunited. They were 39 at the time. This was of course a big moment in their lives, obviously, because for 37 years, they barely knew of each other's existence. When they finally met, yeah, the long lost twins had a bit more in common than anybody ever thought. For starters, both had been named Jim, which is amazing. I spoiled that in the fun title. But their adoptive parents both named the lads Jim. That's crazy. And both Jims loved math and carpentry. Both also had jobs in security at the time of their reconnection, and their ex-wives were both named Linda. And they'd since married a woman both named Betty. I don't know, this is kind of too parallel university for me. Imagine meeting another you, and he's like, yeah, I love surfing and IMAX movies. What are the odds? Like, how specific is this? Are you kidding? No way, that's for sure an alien. He's a scroll. He's an imposter. Get him out. Number three. The Brown Sox. The Great Molasses Flood, aka the Boston Molasses Disaster. 
was an event that occurred January 1919 in the North End neighborhood of Boston, Massachusetts. Happy New Year, everybody. Time to get sticky. Yeah, apparently weather temperatures had risen in Boston at the time, and the mixture of cold and hot molasses together mixed due to the thermal expansion already inside the tank, eventually burst open and collapsed. Yeah, surf's up, dude. 2.3 million gallons of molasses, actually, weighing around 13,000 tons, and resulted in a wave of molasses about 25 feet high. Yeah, just rushing through the streets at an estimated 60 kilometers an hour. Sadly, killing around 21 people and injuring about 150. Yeah, yikes. The event entered local folklore and residents claimed for decades afterwards that the area still smelled of molasses. Yeah, Boston Brown Sox. How did we miss that? That would've been great. White Sox, Red Sox, Brown Sox, no. It was reported in papers that quote, everything that a Bostonian touched was sticky. You know? <laughs> hey, this brown goop, yeah, it's wicked sticky. Watch your feet. Number two. Brand new bees. Yes, about time. A lot of us know bees is pretty harmless. They're fuzzy little pollinators. Unless, of course, you're allergic. Then in that case, get out of here. Just run. We got you. But bees normally do a lot more good than harm. That was, of course, until an experiment in the 70s went south and created an entirely new crossbred evil bee. Awesome. Look out, I guess. This experiment was to take a regular honey bee and then breed it with a bee that's found in Africa that produces way more honey. And then, of course, the goal was to produce a manageable bee that would also provide more honey than a regular honey bee, right? Just better stuff. Well, the bees that came out were a lot less manageable, turns out, and they didn't even make more honey. Just, uh, just an F all the way down. Throw some Fs in the chat, boys. After this experiment ended, however, the bees got out into the environment, and then the 80s saw the beginning of some bee trouble. Yeah, they got out. Heads up, guys. New bees. Imagine that, being like, yeah, the bees got out. Yeah, they're new. We don't know. We don't know what they like to do. These bees are not only aggressive towards other kinds of bees, which, okay, relax, world star, that creates a huge problem, but they're also very aggressive towards humans. And when these bees sting you, their stinger stays with them. So they can, you know, keep Julius Caesaring you over and over instead of losing the, losing the shank. Victims of these swarms receive 10 times the amount of stings as a regular swarm. Awesome, and they react to disturbances 10 times as fast, and they'll also chase said disturbance a quarter of a mile, so hope you got your running shoes on today. These bees have actually caused at least a thousand deaths also, so yes, keep your heads up, they're definitely deadly. Number one, tree huggers. Gotta end on a nice one, you know what I mean? Just spent some time up north climbing, planting some trees myself this past weekend, but you know, the great tree. Yeah, can't really climb this one. The great banyan tree is located in Howrah, India. It's huge, like, Huge, huge, and beautiful. The entire garden is actually one individual tree that spans four acres and is over 80 feet tall, making it one of the natural marvels of the world. Why is this not a UNESCO World Heritage Site by now? It was planted by locals of unknown almost 300 years ago. That's nice. The old Great Banyan tree has roots that cover vast distances. Yeah, just for some numbers here, that's as wide and round as a Walmart. This thing is bigger than a Walmart. The canopy is all connected like the neural highway of a brain, connecting to each other in one giant labyrinth of root and leaf. Of course, the Sherman tree in California that was planted is the largest tree, but the humanity alone of this sacred tree humbles us in how small we are, how connected we could be, and the beauty of what a little bit of patience can do. That's nice, that's really nice.